Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Fed Chair Jay Powell says rates will climb higher and stay there longer than markets anticipated after the FOMC hikes by half a point while Wall Street drops. Asia stocks follow. Next up, Bailey and Lagarde. Policy decisions are front and center in Europe. The BOE and the ECB seem following the Fed with face 50 basis point rate hikes. Plus, documents show FTX executives may have used computer code to mask Alameda Research ballooning debt. Now, we're getting some breaking news. Maybe we've gone to the markets, but also we're getting a Norges Bank. This is a very interesting bank because we've spoken in the past to uh, the central bank governor who gave us more of a guidance and maybe some of the bigger banks about what he was attending to do. Today, they've raised the benchmark interest rates to 2.75%. Now, that's pretty much in line with expectations. Uh, this is uh, what most economists had predicted, which is why we're seeing actually movement on the Norwegian krona fairly muted. On to the rest of the markets, five big central banks today. We not only have the S&B, we not only have Norges Bank, but some of the other ones further afield in the emerging markets. And then the focus, of course, firmly on the BOE and the ECB. Now, the S&B, the Swiss franc, was an interesting one because out of the inflation figures that are pretty high in the OECD, Switzerland is actually not seeing as high as inflation. It's the lowest amongst OECD member countries. They hiked as expected, and you can see a Swiss franc at zero. 9290. I don't know whether we have an asset class for you, but the main interesting story is exactly what we're seeing, for example, on uh, not only euro dollar, but a bit of pressure after we heard Jay Powell on the dot plot really trying to hammer that message home to the markets that look next year there are more hikes coming and they will probably stay there for longer. All right, let's look at the European map. Maybe that gives us a clue on the difference between, for example, a CAC 40 where we're seeing pressure down at 1.1 percent, DAX. Of course, we firmly look at Frankfurt because of that decision from the ECB. And of course, that's also followed from a press conference from Christine Lagarde. We're not getting a press conference from Andrew Bailey of the Bank of England today. So it's shaping up as a big week for central banks. Yesterday, we all know the Fed decided on a 50 basis point hikes. Today, as we've been telling you, BOE and the ECB both poised to slow the recent pace of hikes. We're now joined by Georgina Taylor, fund manager and Invesco's multi-asset team. Also with us are Bloomberg Markets and Quants reporter Justina Lee. So thank you both for joining us. Justina, let's kick off with you. What are we, in terms of what's most important, I think the Fed really gave a tone of, look, we're tapering for now, but we're not done hiking. Are we going to see and hear the same from the ECB and the Bank of England? Yeah, I mean, investors are certainly expecting a similar decision from ECB and the Bank of England in the form of a, you know, a, a 50 basis point hike. And I think we have already seen signs of, you know, inflation easing in Europe, and people will certainly be on the lookout for whether um, central bankers are acknowledging this. Because in the U.S., I mean, we've kind of seen mixed signals, you know, between the PPI and the job reports, and of course, the better than expected CPI last week. But the message coming from Fed officials is that they're looking for, you know, not just one report, but maybe a series of them to confirm the fact that inflation is, in fact, decelerating in the U.S. Uh, Georgina, where are you expecting the most fireworks to be or what could be mispriced in the markets, depending on what central banks say? I think it's the general tone. I think the the shock last night was certainly how long rates could stay on hold for once they do reach the peak that they end up um, hiking to. And I think, you know, today it, it's about the rhetoric and the messaging. I think what's quite interesting about today is that you might get quite a different message out of the Bank of England versus the ECB in terms of that direction of travel. Maybe the Bank of England wanting to contain things slightly because we have a slightly different mix of economic challenges in the UK. Um, so maybe actually, you know, the, the interest and excitement could come from the ECB and particularly what they do on the quantitative tightening side as well. Um, but there is a huge amount for markets to grapple with. So I think it will be a combination of today plus what was said last night for people really trying to, to take a view on, on where to go and where to position going forward. Georgina, what are you expecting from the ECB actually on, you know, preparing the market for QT? I feel like the market in, in certain parts of what they're hearing, but they're not actually listening to what central banks are saying. Is QT one of them? 
possibly. And I think it, it's, you know, I don't exactly know, you know, the way that things will go today, but I think things will be said and things will be mapped out. And I think from a market's perspective, we are dealing with a combination of events and policy changes that we just have not seen and had to deal with before. And I think the the market is digesting that we are genuinely in a different investment regime now. And I think that is almost being seen in exactly what's happened this week. You know, after a softer CPI data, we all got excited that maybe, you know, hikes won't be as aggressive as we were starting to think. We were going back to an investment environment that we understand, pulling ourselves back to um, maybe something that looks more familiar. And last night was a reminder that things have shifted and they have sizably changed for markets. And I think yeah. that combined with comments today will, will be the, the ongoing surprise for, for markets. Um, Justina, talk to me a little bit about whether you were surprised by the market reaction to the Fed not being as dovish as they were expecting. I mean, they, they have told us, you know, week and week over that rates will have to go higher just to get to their target. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because we, we did see a return of a lot of the tightening trades. You know, stocks were down, bond yields were up, the dollar is up today. But at the same time, if you look at expectations for the peak rate next year, it actually didn't move that much. And I think by some people's, you know, calculations, and in fact, the bond yield probably maybe did not move as much as what some people would have expected. And I think what this shows is, you know, partly markets, um, you know, investor skepticism that things really are, you know, will not change because ultimately we have seen the CPI easing. They're increasingly concerned of concerns of a recession, especially if you look at the yield curve. And so I think investors are still a little bit skeptical about whether the Fed can stick to this tightening path, even though yesterday was certainly a reminder that they plan to stick to that. And then they're more worried about stopping tightening too early rather than the reverse. Um, Georgina, you prefer credit over equities right now. What would need to happen for that to be reversed? Yeah, I'm slightly worried about it because I feel it's quite consensus because this crisis hasn't come and emanated from the, the corporate balance sheet. It's been other factors that have driven it. Um, I think really for us to change that view would be how deep the earnings downturn turns out to be. I think that feels to us the bit that hasn't really been repriced. It keeps the risk in equities, which is why we prefer credit. We think you're paid a little bit more in credit to take that risk. But there is an assumption that default rates aren't going to go up a huge amount. And the longer this goes yeah. on for the longer this persists, those risks rise. So to be reviewed as, as kind of these economic challenges play out. I, I think you've also reduced your long U.S. dollar position. Again, I, is that with conviction? Yeah, it's hard. We've held on to some dollar exposure. I think we're just very aware that everything was aligned for the dollar in 2022. And there's been a cyclical support for the dollar as well as a defensive support for the dollar. I think now those interest rate differentials shift. We're seeing other central banks responding. They're hiking rates. Maybe it's not all about the Fed. Um, and so the dollar might just come under a little bit of pressure. Um, today aside, um, there's a bit of support there. But I think you have to be a bit more careful. And also from a multi-asset perspective, is the dollar your diversifier. It's been hugely um, beneficial to hold the dollar this year. It may not be necessarily the diversifier going into 2023. And we're just aware of that. So spreading that risk a little more broadly. Justina, how much volatility do you think we'll get into the, the first couple of months of 2023? Oh, wow. I mean, I think that, you know, probably quite a bit. Um, because what I think the Fed report um, confirms yesterday is, you know, people will still be looking at all the reports that points to uh, you know, price pressure from the jobs one to PPI to CPI. And at the same time, there's almost like a conflicting narrative out there because there are also concerns that we might be grappling with a recession. And in that case, what does that mean for bond yields? And what does that mean for all these downtrodden tech stocks that investors have basically abandoned this year? Yeah, great. Thank you both, of course, for all of the insight. Georgina Taylor, their fund manager in Invesco's multi-asset team, and our Bloomberg Markets and Quants reporter, Justina Lee, joining us this morning. Coming up, we'll have a full wrap, well, a full countdown, actually, to the ECB rate decision today, with the central bank poised to slow the recent pace of hikes. We discuss QT next. This is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, let's talk about the ECB. It's also due to make its latest rate decision later today. So, of course, we have the BOE, we had the SB, we had Norges Bank, and now it's the turn of the ECB as well. For more, we're joined from Frankfurt by Bloomberg's Maria today. So, Maria, a hike, well telegraphed, but how much uncertainty is there around the size? Well, very well telegraphed. And uh, Francine, uh, over the past 24 hours, I think it's very fair to say some of the uncertainty, the animal spirits around the size of this hike uh, have now flipped. And the inclination today in uh, Frankfurt is that we go for 50 uh, basis points. That takes the uh, deposit rate to 2%. And of course, that wraps it and does it for the year. And now, if we do get confirmation of that 50 basis points, and that's 250 basis points in one year. It's the fastest on record for the ECB. It really speaks to the challenge of inflation that they have. And on that note, Francine, it'll be interesting uh, to see their new economic projections. They will upgrade both uh, GDP projections. Again, the debate of a recession, yes or no, what type of recession. But most crucially, and this is a number to focus on, is the medium-term inflation. At one point, does inflation peak in the eyes of the European Central Bank? So, Maria, the other big question, of course, for the ECB is what kind of blueprint, how will they guide the markets towards QT? QT and uh, Francine, in some ways, they have done the prep work for this. We've talked about this huge reversal in the rate cycle, the 200 basis points, potentially the one to come uh, now, the early repayments of the TLT roads. That's, again, an idea behind this is to drain uh, liquidity off the system. So, obviously, the next logical step is QT. In fact, the head of the European Central Bank has also promised that today the market would get the principles. But there are real questions about this. Will she go into detail? Will she keep it vague? Of course, the market, they want to know the timeline. Is it an early QT or do you wait until Q2 next year? And of course, the format. When we speak for QT made by the European Central Bank, what does it mean? I think to me, that's a real question. She will be hammered on this in the press conference. But the eye, again, the attention will be on the amount of detail that she's willing to give today. Yeah, but of course, watch that press conference very, very closely. I know we will. Maria, thank you so much. I'm Maria today over there in Frankfurt for us. Now, let's also get the latest on the crypto front. Bloomberg has learned that a former FTX executive shared computer code that hid mounting liabilities at Alameda Research, a sister trading company of FTX. Now, internal documentation offers clues to the origins of a mysterious account that a regulator alleges helped hide debts at Alameda. Now, FTX's engineering director has not been charged with a crime and did not immediately respond to requests for comment. So to unpack all of this is Bloomberg's crypto senior editor, Anna Herrera. Anna, I have to say this reads more like a, a mystery every day with all of the intrigue and, of course, things that we don't know in investigations. So what could it mean, uh, you know, if, if this proves to be true uh, and what does it mean for Sam bankman fried that's already been charged with a number of things? Well, you know, the CFTC investigation, there are multiple investigations, uh, showed that Alameda Research had basically unlimited access to customer funds, FTX customer funds to trade. And so sort of our story shows that perhaps some of that might have been in an account that was coded so that you could hide it and, and other people might not see that it was Alameda's account, but it looked like someone else's account, potentially, or some other form so, of account. So, so at the moment, we're just waiting for, for it to play out, right? It feels like every day we're talking about Binance, and I know you're on top of all of this. Like, where do we go next in this investigation? Um, I think that we might hear more from other people that were involved. Obviously, Sam bankman fried didn't run his empire all on his own. There were a number of lieutenants. We don't know how or if anyone was involved or will be charged or if they're collaborating, but that might be another thing to follow for sure. Um, Senator Elizabeth Warren also warned that we may see more cases and charges brought against other places in the market. Is she, is she one of the most vocal senators in the U.S.? I mean, all of this is happening or most of this is happening in the U.S. Yes, yeah, it, yeah. I, I guess she has been uh, one of the proponents for, for more regulation of the space. And this sort of shows that perhaps a little bit more regulation would have helped or even just following the regulations that were in place. Because obviously if they're being charged, then it means that there was something that they didn't follow. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, senators and policymakers and regulators across the world have been warning, warning is this lack of separation of powers in exchanges that poses potential conflicts of interest. You see here a hedge fund owned by the exchange and the money being commingled. And uh, we also saw some record outflows from Binance yesterday. Again, how do we get 
you know, upfront on it? What does it tell us about the linkage and the fact that also CZ of Binance tried to, you know, stem the outflows? I don't know how successful he's been. So it, the outflows have calmed down a bit. And I think it's, it's outflows have, have peaked across exchanges in general. That's because investors are a bit wary now, of course. They've seen multiple centralized companies collapse. If you had your money on FTX uh, in, a month ago, suddenly it was gone. So you might be a bit wary of leaving it on another exchange, even if you think perhaps the exchange is doing fine. And, you know, it's a cyclical thing, but it, the confidence has kind of dropped on centralized exchanges for sure. And who do we know has lost money? And I, and I know we were talking a bit about it yesterday. It could be some institutional investors, but is it like the moms and pops that just had retail investments in, or, or their savings into this? So FTX was known as like a trader's exchange. It was right. Their slogan was built by traders for traders. So it's likely that a lot of the big losses were big players. And we've seen a creditor's list, but it has been redacted. So we don't know who's on it. But they did have one million creditors. So a lot of them will have been normal people who put their, their savings or something in, in there, both on the U.S. exchange or even on the international one. And they wouldn't be protected, right? There's no, because it's not really regulated, it's kind of, yeah, it's not, it's not it the Wild West, but it's, it's not, there's no one that you can go to and say, there's yeah. there's no there's no insurance right it's not a bank account where you have FDIC protection and there's insured to a certain amount so that's part of the problem many of these firms sort of said it's like we're like a bank account you, you can pay back we'll give you interest on your deposits but you know that kind of gives you the impression that it might be like a bank account and insured but it's not so yeah that's a big problem Anna thank you so much for all of the insight of course Anna Herrera one of our senior editors and she will continue bringing us up to date with all the crypto stories coming up China could face a heavy COVID human toll according According to a recent study, we'll have the latest economic data points as well as a point to a worsening slowdown. That's coming up next, and this is Blooper. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Fed Chair Jerome Powell says the U.S. central bank is not close to ending its anti-inflation campaign, hinting at ongoing rate increases in the coming year. In the wake of a 50 basis point hike, policymakers projected rates would end next year at 5.1 percent before being cut to 4.1 percent in 2024, a higher level than previously indicated. Powell says the size of the next rate increase in February will depend on the day. Data. Now, China's economic activity worsened in November amid widespread virus outbreaks and restrictions. Retail sales contracted 5.9% from a year ago, worse than the 4% expected by economists. The jobless rate climbed to the highest level since May, while industrial output growth slowed to 2.2%. More disruption is likely in December as the government continues its abrupt exit from COVID-0. U.S. regulators are taking the first step towards the most widespread revamp of stock trading in more than a decade. It's aimed at spurring better prices for investors and directing more business to traditional exchanges. The SEC laid out four proposals it says will boost transparency and also competition. The plan affects order routing prices and disclosures that brokers must make to clients. HSBC says it will no longer finance new oil and gas fields and related infrastructure projects, a move that climate activists say puts it ahead of many peers in addressing global warming. The new policy covers both loans and debt underwriting. HSBC has been among the world's biggest financiers of fossil fuel companies, helping provide more than $110 billion of debt since the Paris Agreement was signed back in 2015. And employment in Australia surged by more than three times economist estimates last month as unemployment held at a 48-year low. That's reinforcing expectations the Reserve Bank will raise interest rates further in 2023. The economy added 64,000 jobs in November, well ahead of forecasts of 19,000. It suggests the economy is 
so far weathering the sharpest monetary tightening in more than 30 years. And Elon Musk has sold another block of Tesla shares worth at least three and a half billion dollars. An SEC filing shows he unloaded at least 22 million shares over the past few days. Tesla closed on Wednesday below a half a trillion dollar valuation. Now that's for the first time since November 2020. Shares are down 55 percent so far this year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Uh, the picture is uh, one of central banks. There's a lot of central bank action. I know we have a full roundup of decision day guide, not only for the ECB, but also for the Bank of England. Uh, that's coming up. But in the meantime, Norway Central Bank raised borrowing costs to the highest level in more than a decade. So actually, first, let's start with SNB, the Swiss National Bank, raising interest rates by 50 basis points. Again, so this is a third salvo against inflation that narrows the gap with the borrowing costs of global peers, and then Norway also raising rates. Coming up, we focus on the UK. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK, a new show with a special focus on the biggest challenges facing the British government, economy, financial services and markets. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, on the show this week, the Bank of England actually takes center stage in a hectic week for central banks across the globe. The BOE will probably slow the pace of tightening on concerns that the UK recession will deepen. We'll break down what it means for the British economy with Charles Goodhart, former BOE chief advisor, and Victoria Clark, the UK chief economist at Santander. Plus, the chance of the exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, finds himself in the company of Tom Cruise and Kim Kardashian. All three make it onto Bloomberg's top 50 people who defined global business in 2022. So we'll talk about that and the strikes. Now, the Bank of England is due to to reveal its latest rate decision later today. The central bank, of course, is poised to slow the recent pace of interest rate hikes. Now, for more on all of this, we go straight outside the Bank of England, just moments away from our central headquarter in London, where Lizzie Burden is standing by. So, Lizzie, investors and economists are expecting a half a point hike. What else are we looking for today? I think we're having a couple of technical difficulties when it comes to uh, Lizzie Burden, who's just outside the Bank of England. Sometimes the closer you are to headquarters, the more difficult it is to get the sound up. We'll get a full debrief, of course, from Lizzie Burden, but this is what we're looking for. First of all, we're expecting a, almost a 50-50 split when it comes to MPC members. The tricky uh, bit, of course, of the situation is that just like the Federal Reserve in the U.S., you don't want to, to hike rates too much to deal with inflation because that would undue push the economy into a recession. Uh, the trick here in the UK is that it's even more complicated than in other parts of the world. So let's maybe have a look at what uh, investors are expecting. In terms of what we heard from Andrew Bailey, I was at a press conference on financial stability two days ago. Now, it would have been, of course, completely, completely illegal for him to talk about uh, what we're expecting uh, today. But look, this is what we know in terms of policy statements and exactly what it would boil down to. So the decision day guide is really that we're expecting the Bank of England to temper rate hike aggression, I guess, to see how it pans out, see how the previous hikes impact the economy. And of course, the concern is that overly aggressive action might unnecessarily deepen the recession in 20. Now, to talk about all of this, we're joined by the former chief advisor at the Bank of England, now emeritus professor at the London School of Economics. He is one Charles Goodhart. Mr. Goodhart, thank you so much for joining us. How worried are you that the Bank of England is actually late? They're behind the curve, and now they temper some of the hikes. Uh, I think that they moved far too late there. I can understand why. Uh, and I think they're still too low. Um, my expectation and the market's expectation is that they will raise rates by 50 basis points today. Uh, there's a possibility that they might increase that by less. Uh, there's a fake possibility that they might increase it by more. I would have liked that, but I think it's unlikely. 
but is it also unlikely that it will pause its hiking cycle too soon? So is the message similar to what we heard from the Fed, that they will stay aggressive for longer, but for the moment not as aggressive because they're not quite sure what happens early 2023? I think the Fed's position on this is absolutely right. I'm frightened slightly uh, that there'll be more doves on the Bank of England's monetary policy committee and that they will uh, stop the hiking cycle too early and before they can be sure that they will get inflation back to target. All right, Mr. Goodhart, let's also bring in Victoria Clark. He, she is UK chief economist at Santander's corporate and investment banking division. Victoria, thank you for joining us. Look, the way the nine-member MPC actually operates is, of course, different to the Fed. I wonder whether most of them would have loved to have a dot plot because that would give us a very clear indication of what the terminal rate, where they see interest rates longer term. Well, we think that the BOE is quite reluctant to have a dot plot. I mean, it was happy to send a message in November because it was trying to get mortgage rates down. And so it wanted to really try and send a message that it thought market pricing was too aggressive. But actually, it, it doesn't want to send an explicit message because it isn't quite sure how far rates are going to need to go and how long it's going to hold them there. So it, in, in a way, it's quite happy keeping things a little bit vague. Perhaps um, I agree with Charles that you might get a little bit of a, of a dovish message today because they are that worried about the housing market. What, what do you worry about the most? Is it under, you know, it, I guess the question is, what's the worst of two evils? Is it hiking too much or hiking too little? Exactly. It, lots of bad options. I think at the moment they have, you know, they put out a huge amount of rate rises. They're starting to see the impact of that on the economy. But you've still got much too much pay growth. And, you know, inflation is, you know, far from on the clear, decisive downward track. So they need to keep going for the time being. But they've got to be a bit careful. So I think that, you know, at the moment, for them, the balance of risk says, look, let's go. Let's go a little bit more slowly this time with 50 basis points and again yeah. in February. But they have to be mindful of how much yeah. they've done. And I think you'll get a little bit more of that with the voices of the doves, a couple of dissenting doves today. Yeah, th this is a concern, right, uh, Charles Goodher, is that you also have to take into account the hikes that you've done so far to basically game theory. You're not only data dependent because that would could possibly lead to a mistake. I think we have a great chart of the MPC looking at the hawks and, and the, the doves. If we have a 44, well, a 4 4 split, which way do you think Andrew Bailey will vote? Which way would you have voted, Mr. Goodhart? All right. Okay, we're not having much luck, actually, w with uh, technology uh, th this morning. This is the picture, um, Victoria, of what we're seeing, you know, how the nine-member mem MPC basically will decide on rates. Uh, last time, officials, I think, voted 7-2 to lift rates to 3%, and that was the highest level in 14 years. The dissenters were Swatcha Dingra, who voted for half a point rise, and Silvana Atinreiro, who preferred a quarter point. How do you think it'll be today? This time, um, Dingra no change at all. Yep. Um, uh, sorry, Tenreiro, no change at all. Yep. Dingra, 25 basis points. Most of the committee, including Andrew Bailey um, for 50, and then Catherine Mann for 75. So a very, very divided MPC in a very different uh, mindset direction to the Fed, which is a much yep. more chair-led institution. Yeah, and, and Victor, of course, what we want to know, and we're hoping to get it today, is actually when the BOE hopes and thinks that inflation could be at target. We had that faster yeah. inflation fall. Now, I know it's easier, right, economically to go from 10% to 5% and much harder yeah. to go from like 5% to 3% inflation. So what that's are the dynamics of inflation that you're expecting? I think that's, that's it. So we've had a bit of a drop in headline inflation. Services inflation actually is still rising. And I think this is going to be a worry. You know, for the Hawks on the MPC, there's still plenty there. Strong pay growth figures this week. Um, yes, inflation probably has passed its peak, but it's probably still going to be close to 10% by March and close to 7% by next summer. So this isn't, you know, inflation, embedded inflation risks dealt with. They've still oh. got this inflation battle to tackle. So they have to get that balance. They have to show an awareness of a slowing economy, but also show that they are committed to the cause on inflation. Um, 
Mr. I don't know whether we have Mr. Goodhart actually or not. I don't know whether we, we fixed uh, the technical difficulties. We made some great charts for you, Victoria. We have three charts that are absolutely killing it in terms of how you break down, first of all, uh, national asking prices for houses. That's by right move. Inflation, of course, outpacing uh, wage growth and then some of the energy component of inflation. So let's see if we can get a chart up for you. Bloomberg does this better than anyone because we have all the data, of course, at our disposal. I mean, the concern is... Is there, is there any chance that inflation could come down as quickly as it came up? I don't think so. I mean, look, there's always a chance because in this world, we're looking at big geopolitical forces, looking for what the news is with regards to the war in Ukraine and, and gas prices and all of these things yeah. mean that there are bigger um, possibilities and ranges of uncertainty than normal. But really, you know, it looks as if we're going to be pretty sticky with UK inflation yeah. and actually stickier than overseas because of the way that our energy prices work. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think that the risk for, for the Bank of England is that they're looking still at sticky inflation and upside risk to inflation, um, for, you know, for longer. Um, sure. Let's also look actually at wages and we look at real wages. And of course, we're in the middle of strikes. It's Royal Mail. It's, it's some of the rail. I mean, as an economist, how much do increases by nurses from the NHS actually feed to inflation? I mean, I, it can't be that much. It, it, it shouldn't be that much because these aren't, you know, these wage settlements aren't going to lead to increases in, you know, big company yeah. selling prices. So, uh, you know, at face value, you wouldn't look at this and say, look, this is massively inflationary. Um, the headline pay growth figures have, of course, been held down by the fact that public sector pay has been running much, much below private sector pay. Um, and, you know, perhaps there is an element of this throwing focus on the issue of the tight labour market. Yeah. The strikes perhaps make other people think, OK, what am I going into my pay negotiation and pay settlements with? And so it probably doesn't help that environment of, um, you know, concerns and upward pressure on yeah. pay growth at this point in time. Victoria, thanks so much. Victoria Clark there, Santander's UK Chief Economist, stays with us and we'll try to get back to Charles Goodhart. He's Emeritus Professor at the London School of Economics and, of course, ex-Bank of England. Now, coming up, we'll have more on the UK with our panel when we focus a lot more on some of the grace growth. But actually, what we'll talk about is also housing prices and the likelihood of a housing crash. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, let's talk, of course, a lot more about uh, the UK wages. They're rising at close to a record pace, maintaining pressure on the Bank of England to keep hiking rates despite a worsening economic outlook. Now, those gains far outpaced by inflation, with consumer prices rising 10.7% in the year to November, fueling a growing wave of strikes across the country. Now, we're now uh, rejoined by Victoria Clark, UK Chief Economist in Santander's Corporate and Investment Banking Division. Victoria, thank you so much. First of all, for sticking around, we're talking a little bit about strikes and the fact that, you know, from a purely economic point, it, maybe it doesn't have that much of an impact if NHS uh, nurses, who frankly deserve it, to get, get a pay rise. But talk to me about the impact of strikes. So we're hearing about cancellations. Yeah. How difficult is it to model the impact, the negative impact this would have on the economy? It, it's, it's pretty difficult. I mean, particularly given that, you know, when we're looking back at uh, the data, we haven't seen strikes impacting the number of working days that, that we're likely to see in December since the late 1980s. So we don't have good comparable data. And of course, we know that everybody's become much more adept at sort of flexible working where that's been possible through the pandemic. So, you know, one could say the disruption that you'll see from, from that striking might be less this time around. But it, of course, comes at a really critical time for the economy, retail firms yeah. under pressure, um, you know, big pre-Christmas restaurant, hotel, hospitality bookings. And these are segments of the economy that are really struggling under the pressure of high energy prices. So, I mean, I think it will have, have a really big impact. Um, you know, the December GDP figures will probably show that. Um, and the question is, how much of a bounce back do we see 
in January and which businesses are, you know, are in such a vulnerable position that this may be the last straw for them. Uh, Victoria, do you see some kind of event? I mean, I know there, are, you know, gilt markets were all over the place and we really came very close to a, a disaster, really. Mm. And the Bank of England keeps on saying, look, we need to fix that part of the market. Is there anything that you worry about that's systemic? Is it mortgages? Is it housing? Is it something else? Um, if, if you look at what the Bank of England was saying in its financial stability report this week, I mean, it seems lots of pockets of really big pressure, yeah. but nothing that it you know, at least wants to fess up as being systemic. And of course, it can't say that. But there are some enormous pressures here. I mean, record squeeze to real household disposable income over the next year. Households facing mortgage increases of probably three and a half thousand pounds more annually on average if you're looking to refinance yeah. onto a fixed rate. So some really big pressures that are going to come in and I think you know it's how these come together yes. that's going to be the big test. Yeah I mean the housing for the UK is is very crucial I mean it's not as crucial as Sweden or certainly we haven't seen that kind of house price drops because we've gone through it about 10 years ago yeah. but w what are you worried about is it house prices is it mortgages and we have a great chart really looking at for example I think this is a right move chart looking at UK house prices and they fall you know about 10 percent and they could go even lower. So, so certainly the momentum's there, negative momentum in house prices. We're seeing, you know, big drops in, in the indications of buyer appetite. That all becomes more self-fulfilling the more we hear talk about house prices falling because that puts off prospective buyers. So I think that momentum's there. And as you can see in the, in the right move data, you know, we are seeing more signals that that's going to continue. Um, the fact that the Jobs market is is so tight. Yeah. Probably helps. Yeah. Um, that should help to, to limit the extent of the falls. But I think that the momentum yeah. that's there at the moment is going to keep that going. Of course, prices have come up a lot. We've had um, stamp duty land tax incentives, Huge. which have yes. led to big rises in prices over the last two years. So you know, one argument would be that this is a bit of adjustment, an adjustment backwards from that. But we need people to be able to repay mortgages, and for the moment, a lot of them are fixed. A lot of them will drop off fixed in 2023 yes. and yeah. how much of a disaster could that be it's I mean it's a big cliff edge you've got about 50 percent of households coming to you know refinance at these higher rates in 2023 so that is massive and as I say three and a half thousand pounds a year is a massive amount of money so um, that affordability pressure is, is there I think that you know this time around we've seen a bit of news on this in the last week lenders will be encouraged to look at you know ways to help people manage this interest only mortgages so there are you know there are routes to try and help people through what's probably yeah. going to be uh, a, you know a one year pressure point and then let's say inflation does fall when well, the bank of england could be cutting rates again a year from now and i think yep. that's probably what it's hoping that it can deal with the inflation Once, and then hopefully uh, ease some of that pressure on those households facing the high mortgage rates. Victoria, on, on jobs, and I, I keep on hearing, look, we could just about muddle through as long as the labour market, you know, it's tight but it holds on. Yes. There's also a weird phenomenon that it's it's older population coming back into work. Now, this is one of the great mysteries for me because I go to the Bank of England pressers and yeah. they talk about, of course, long COVID and, and the effects. Is this um, the older workforce coming back because of the cost of living crisis or because actually they're less sick? So, I mean, the big picture, right, is that we still have many fewer people no. actively in the workforce than we did before the pandemic. And you're right, we've seen some hints of, of some movement back, and that may well be related to cost of living pressures. Um, but, um, that, you know, there's still a big imbalance there, and it's, you know, it's, it's trending in the wrong direction for the UK in, in many of our peers' economic inactivity, the people that have stepped outside of the workforce is, is starting um, to shift back. Whereas in the UK, the, the trend actually has been that it's carried on worsening. And well, there's lots of different theories out there. One thing we've been looking at is perhaps the role of NHS waiting lists in, in keeping people out of the workforce and long term sick from COVID. And if that trend continues, that only adds to this long list of very difficult issues um, for you know for the Bank of England for the UK economy and and potentially more persistent pay growth as well. Victoria thank you so much for all of the insight. Victoria Clark there UK Chief Economist at Santander in Santander's Corporate and Investment Banking Division joining us this morning. Coming up we'll have plenty more of course on the UK. Jeremy Hunt among the Bloomberg 50 a list of those who've defined business in 2022. It's not every year we get a UK chancellor on that list so we'll talk about why he made it and who else is on the list. That's next. This is Blue Break.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So it's one of my favorite days of the year because Bloomberg has published its annual list of 50 people who defined global business in the last 12 months. Now this year's Bloomberg 50 includes names across politics, sports, science and entertainment. Among the global list, one name stands out here in the UK and that's the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. So for more on all of this, let's talk to Bloomberg's Adam Blenford. So Adam, I was really surprised because it's not ever I love this list. We look at it every year. You put it together every year. I haven't in, in you know recent memory remembered when there was a UK chancellor on it. So why is Jeremy Hunt in the top 50? Well, thanks, Francine. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's, it's a collaborative effort between many, many people in the Bloomberg newsroom. Um, but one well, one thing about Jeremy Hunt this year, of course, is that if you cast your minds back to the the, the economic and fiscal chaos unleashed by the, the mini budget during uh, Liz Truss's prime ministership, Jeremy Hunt was parachuted in as a sort of emergency chancellor. And very quickly, in a chaotic year for the UK, when you can't say there were that many standout superstars, he became pretty much the most important person in the country. Remember that time, Truss was still prime minister in name, uh, in power, in, in office, but not in power. And Hunt was there for a, for a, for a few, uh, a, couple, a week or two, uh, put his head down in Downing Street, re reorganizing um, the economic uh, sort of background of the UK, trying to calm the markets, bringing down bond yields, which had risen way over 4%, and uh, attempting to kind of redress the balance. Um, eventually, of course, he was kept in office then by the new Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, where he still remains, and he unveiled an autumn statement, a big budget in all but name, uh, attempting to, uh, which, which included tax rises, and uh, the promise uh, or the threat even yeah. of spending cuts, public spending cuts down the line in an attempt to, to balance the books again. So he became really the, the man with the sort of future of the UK in his hands yeah. very quickly, almost overnight. I mean, I just love, and he probably love it too, that he's on a list with like Tom Cruise and Jennifer Hudson. So because this is Bloomberg UK, who else has made it from the, the UK? Well, like I said, perhaps it wasn't a standout year for the UK. Um, people who, who have been uh, active in the UK and with the UK this year include um, the new owner of Chelsea Football Club. Of course, if you, again, cast your minds back, of course, um, the Vladimir Putin's Russia invaded Ukraine and all of a sudden all of those oligarchs and their tycoons had their assets frozen. Chelsea Football Club, one of the biggest jewels in the Premier League, was in the hands of Roman Abramovich for 20 or so years. And Todd Bowley, a US investment manager, uh, multi-billionaire uh, chairman and founder of Eldridge, Eldridge uh, he, he, he stepped in and uh, masterminded a bid to take over Chelsea for I think it was something like over five billion dollars um, and uh, you know he's he, he's 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 uh, unlocked that club given it a bit more of hope in the future um, but he's also um, a new player in the sports scene attempting to bring yeah. that kind of American billionaire style back to the to, into the Premier League so we'll see where that goes. Um, there, there are others in the list. Yeah. It's a very diverse list as well. It is. I love it. I mean, it is. We've had such a tough year, actually, in terms of Ukraine, in terms of markets. It's a nice list to also remember some of the do-gooders of this world. Adam, thank you so much. Adam Blenford there from our UK website. Be sure also to subscribe to Bloomberg's In the City podcast that I host along with David Merritt on Apple Podcasts. This is Bloomberg. Today, the FOMC raised our policy interest rate by a half percentage point. We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. It may be that five to five and a quarter is not enough. With inflation running between five and six percent, they would have to raise rates uh, to above six percent, somewhere between six and eight percent. The full effects of our rapid tightening so far are yet to be felt. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards. Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Fed Chair Jerome Powell sees interest rates being higher for longer, but investors see the outlook for next year a little differently. The Bank of England and the European Central Bank are out with their own rate decisions today. Both are likely to slow the pace of rate hikes. 
And Elon Musk unloads Tesla stock for the fourth time this year. He sells another $3.6 billion worth of shares. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kayleigh Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And Kayleigh, it seems the market not entirely convinced with the extent of hawkishness we saw demonstrated by the Fed yesterday. But that didn't stop market participants feeling nervous about holding risk. And we've seen a bit of a sell-off in, uh, in stocks. Yeah, and that definitely was the case in Asia overnight, Anna. Whether that was entirely due to the Federal Reserve yesterday or if it had more to do with the data out of China, though, that is my question. The MSCI Asia Pacific index as a whole uh, was down by about one and a half percent. But that China data was really, really weak. Both business and consumer activity in November dropping to the lowest levels since the Shanghai lockdown back in the spring. You had retail sales, home sales, industrial output falling, unemployment rising, all of it really pretty ugly. But of course, that was before they partake upon this big reopening of the economy. The question is, does that help or hurt more initially as cases are spreading throughout the country? So off the back of the weaker data, the Chinese yuan weakening as well against the U.S. dollar by about half of 1%. 697.70 is where we trade. But while the data was weak in China, it was actually really exceptionally strong in Australia and New Zealand. In Australia, jobs coming in much stronger than expected in New Zealand. GDP coming in much uh, better than expected. And as a result, that is leading to bets on even more tightening in the new year from those central banks. As, and so the 10-year yield in Australia up nine basis points to 345, and the two-year in New Zealand up 16 basis points overnight to 483. Now, as for here in the U.S., as Anna mentioned, it wasn't necessarily taken as an extremely hawkish Fed decision by the market yesterday. Yes, we ended lower, but off of session lows in the equity market. And then the bond market yields actually actually fell slightly. The question is, is the market missing what the Fed was actually saying? But they seem to be singing a more negative tune this morning with S&P 500 futures down more than 1%. And in the bond market, yields moving a bit higher at the short end, up 3.5 basis points on the two-year to 424. Meanwhile, the dollar strengthening against everything in G10 this morning. Uh, the Bloomberg dollar index up about six tenths of one percent, while crude after a three day winning streak is down just a touch. WTI down about three tenths of one percent. We're trading right around seventy seven dollars a barrel, Anna. Let's have a look at the European map then, Kaylee. And it looks red. It's, uh, it's really factoring in some of the nervousness around the Fed story as we wait for the central bank narrative to shift from the United States into here in Europe. But we have extensive selling, really, across European equity markets, in particular in Paris and in Frankfurt, where we're down by more than 1.2% in both cases. Kaylee, you had the uh, oil price, the WTI price on your board. I picked the Brent price because uh, there's been some, a little bit of movement there, and we're actually up at slightly more elevated levels. Let's have a look at where we are on Brent. 82.46. So we're coming down from yesterday's close, uh, but we have in the most recent sessions been making gains back up towards that $80 a barrel mark. We're back over that now. So 82.47 and Goldman Sachs out with some really interesting research. They expect commodity prices in general to increase next year by more than 40 uh, percent. Now put that in your inflation models, put that in your expectations about where uh, inflation and the Fed and other central banks go. Talking of central banks, we're on to a host of European ones today. We've heard from one yet to hear from another two. So let's start with the SNB. The Swiss National Bank increasing interest rates as expected, 50 basis points up to 1%. Uh, so far, so simple. Is this uh, the, the weakness that we're seeing then in the Swiss franc? Is this really uh, to do with what they did at the, at, the, uh, at the central bank there? They're talking about their willingness to go further and their willingness to intervene in FX markets. Or is it to do with the strength of the dollar that we've seen post-Fed? Because that seems to be part of the narrative in the pound and also the euro. We wait to hear from the Bank of England and the ECB later on today, but we've got a stronger dollar. So we have a weaker pound down 7 tenths of 1% and a weaker euro euro down six tenths of one percent. 123.36. We have come a long way back, Kaylee, from those mm. days down at 103 at the depths of the uh, at the post September mini budget uh, turmoil. Uh, so we've come a long way. Will we see a four way split at the Bank of England and on the ECB? The big question is around QT and what they signal there. More details on that uh, coming up. Yeah, still ahead, which I guess means that the year wasn't actually over yesterday, as we all thought it might be after the Federal Reserve decision, because we do have more central banks on deck this morning. As Anna mentioned, the ECB and the BOE both making their last rate decisions of the year. So on that note, let's get to our team coverage this morning. We have Bloomberg's Valerie Titel on the Fed. Maria Tadeo is in Frankfurt on the ECB and Lizzie Burden is covering the Bank of England. Let's start though with the backwards look at the Fed, the U.S. Central Bank hiking as expected by 50 basis points. Here's what Chairman Powell had to say about next year. I wouldn't see us considering rate cuts until the committee is confident that inflation is moving down to 2% in a sustained way. 
So that's that's the that's the test I would articulate. And and you're correct. There there are not rate cuts uh, in in uh, in the SEP for 2023. So let's get over to Valerie Titel, our markets reporter, to unpack Powell's comments and maybe not just Powell's comments, Valerie, but the way the market reacted to them. Yeah, Kaylee, clearly I think the market expected some kind of nod to Tuesday's CPI data, and we really didn't get that. Uh, the 2023 dot, which is most of us view as the terminal rate, was above 5% at 5.1. Some people thought after Tuesday, maybe that could be 4.8, maybe it could be sub-5. And he repeated this word that ongoing rate increases are likely appropriate. To me, and I think most market participants, that means a pause in March is, is a little bit off the table for now. And again, he reiterated substantially more evidence of lower inflation is needed. After this opening statement, attention quickly went to the uh, the economic projections where they nearly halved their growth projection for 2023 to 0.5% of real GDP. And the unemployment rate for 2023 also ticked up. 4.6% is what they're projecting. We know that unemployment at the moment is running at a 50-year low in the U.S. at 3.7%. Powell is clearly trying to communicate that we need some slack in the labor market. And why is that? He repeated again, core services inflation. The biggest input into that is wages. And with wage growth running at 5%, that does not equal core PCE going back to their 2% target. He did end the press conference on a bit more of a dovish note. Uh, he, he, he was... Um, uh, 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 he basically uh, repeated some things like um, we are close to being sufficiently restrictive and that the size of the February uh, hike is going to depend on the data. He's going to leave it a bit open that we might see another step down in 20, uh, another step down to 25 basis points in February. But that really depends on the next CPI print, which we get on January 14th. OK, seems a long way off, doesn't it, Valerie Titel? Thank you very much. Well, not much in it for the doves then when it comes to the Fed meeting, as Valerie was setting out there. What lies ahead then from these European central banks? Let's get to Bloomberg's Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who is in Frankfurt for us. Maria, the Fed went for 50 basis points. The expectation is that the ECB does the same, even if the story around that is a little different. Yes, Anna, and allow me some time because there's a lot to go through today here in this meeting in Frankfurt. On the rate hike, yes, the mood is this inclination towards 50 basis points today to be announced by Madame Lagarde. Overall, that would take the deposit rate to 2%, and you're looking at 250 basis points total up on the year, the fastest on record for the European Central Bank if that is announced and confirmed. Then on top of that, we will get an upgrade, an updated projections on the GDP front. Remember, there's this perennial question of will there be a recession or not and what type of recession. And then, of course, the inflation projections. That is the key to me. What is the outlook over the medium term and when does inflation peak in the eyes of the European Central Bank? And of course, when it comes to the press conference, all eyes on QT. Remember, she had promised she would lay out, quote, the principles of QT, but that means a lot, but it can also mean very little. It will depend on the kind of detail that she wants to provide to markets. Of course, they want to know the format and the timing, but again, there's a lot of question marks around whether Christine Lagarde will want to go into specifics or actually give herself some wiggle room here, considering, by the way, the amount of uncertainty still to play going into 2023. OK, QT and uh, the extent of the slowdown in Europe in focus then at the ECB. Maria Tadeo reporting there from Frankfurt. Let's pivot from the ECB onto the Bank of England story. And the BOE is also expected to slow the pace of interest rates today. Another case of stepping down from 75 to 50. Bloomberg's UK correspondent Lizzie Burden has the details for us. Lizzie, investors and economists are expecting another 50 basis points uh, hike. Something is catching amongst these global central banks. What else are we looking out for today, though? Well, Anna, as you hinted, what I think is going to be really interesting today is the vote split, because for the first time in the bank's independent history, we might get a four-way split. At least that's what Nomura, JP Morgan, Bank of America have all said could happen. Something between 75, 50, 25 and no hike at all. And that's because, on the one hand, you've still got inflation in double digits, proving stubbornly, persistently high. But on the other hand, you've got doves on the committee who are very worried about a big 
big hike taking effect in the heart of a recession. So some would call it chaos, others would say thankfully there isn't groupthink at the Bank of England. The other thing that I'm looking out for today is the guidance because remember at the last meeting the bank pushed back bluntly against the market curve, the future path for rates and if it doesn't do that today, if it doesn't even talk about the market curve, the markets might interpret it as an endorsement but the bank has said it doesn't want to provide a running commentary that was a run off uh, a one off so this is going to be a case of threading the needle but they don't call it thread needle street for nothing <laughs> all right lizzie burden thank you so much looking forward to your coverage on the bank of england throughout the day meanwhile another story we have our eye on this morning ex central banks elon musk has sold another block of tesla shares worth almost 3.6 billion dollars an sec filing shows the ev maker ceo unloaded at least 22 million shares it's set to put further downward pressure on tesla stock which has plunged 55 percent this year craig Trudell, bloomberg global autos editor is joining us now with more. So, Craig, of course, this is not the first big unloading of Tesla stock. We have seen Elon Musk execute this year. Sales are now what? Close to the $40 billion mark. What's behind this latest one? That's right. Uh, it, it's really going to be interesting to see whether Musk, we know that he sort of lives online, lives on Twitter, the company that he just acquired in the last, you know, six weeks or so, uh, whether he starts to address where exactly this money is going to go. As you mentioned, uh, quite a bit of, of money uh, that, that he's cashed in here, uh, almost $40 billion since late last year. Uh, obviously, th lately, the, the concern here is, is just how much of this is you know, going to uh, Twitter and how exactly he's going to put it to use. Does he try to take out some of the high-interest debt that he layered onto the company to, to acquire it? Uh, that obviously is a, a burden that is going to be really difficult for Twitter to handle, given the challenges that it's having with advertisers and the problems that he's having trying to kind of plug that hole with uh, subscription revenue. Obviously, he had to pull back on Twitter Blue for a while after these sort of imposter accounts uh, sort of undercut his efforts to, to you know, start charging people for ver verification. So whether or not he sort of weighs in, uh, he's, he's assured people several times now that he's done selling. And so I think, you know, there may be some reluctance to sort of take him at his mm. word. Uh, going forward, uh, given given the you know several uh, times he's sold since then. Right, yeah, happened a few times. Good morning to you, Craig. So thinking about the broader auto sector, we've got auto sales data out from Europe this morning. We've heard from VW in that context. Um, the Volkswagen CFO actually speaking to Bloomberg TV, Arno Antlitz, uh, sees a rocky road ahead for the industry. Uh, he was speaking to us earlier. Let's listen to what he had to say. 2023 might be even more challenging um, than 2022. Um, the, we, we see the, the economy uh, weakening, we see interest rates um, going up, we see inflation and the, the increased competition. So uh, it will be more difficult to pass on some of the, the headwinds um, in terms of prices. We have to increase our work on the cost side, work on fixed costs, work on, on, on productivity in order to compensate for, for some of these effects. The CFO of the German car company VW there. And Craig, this is really interesting, isn't it? As we go from 22 into 2023, here's a European car maker saying, actually, the challenges next year are going to get bigger. And we saw this sort of across the European story with those car uh, production numbers that we got this morning. Yes, order books are full right now, but there's a lot of nervousness about inflation. Absolutely. And, and you know, there's, there, we're going to go very quickly from problems with supply to perhaps problem with, problems with demand where, you know, there, there is an awful lot of, of purchases that presumably are, are sort of, you know, uh, kind of left over from the fact that companies like Volkswagen have not been able to make uh, enough cars to keep up with demand. But the problem is, you know, just how much longer that is going to last because of higher interest rates, because of consumer confidence waning, because of here in Europe, uh, the energy crisis. Uh, and that's something that even, you know, to go back to Tesla, you've heard even Elon Musk uh, talk about uh, you know th those challenges along with uh, the issues in in China, and so you know this is a case of of an industry that you know very much has had a problem of not being able to make enough to perhaps uh, now you know once they finally can make enough because of the chip shortage easing, 
uh, now the, on the other side of that, uh, they, they may have problems with the consumer. Yeah, really interesting to watch the demand story because, yes, there's the cyclicality, and that's what we're talking about here. There's also the structural shift toward EVs, which no doubt will be at some, uh, to some degree supportive. Craig, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Craig Chadell uh, to talk about the car sector. Now, coming up on the programme, we'll pivot back to the central banking story. We'll get response to the Fed. Danielle Martino Booth joins us, Quill Intelligence CEO and Chief Strategist, a great voice to have post-Fed. What does she make of the market moves and the extent to which the market might be fighting? the Fed is that wise and live from the form of the America forum sorry of the Americas in Paris we will be hearing from the Angie chairman that is Jean-Pierre Clamadeau there is a lot going on in the European energy space right now so a good conversation to bring you plus on the ECB and the Bank of England Josie Dent joins us managing economist at the Center for Economics and Business Research the CEBR she'll give us the European perspective on rate hikes this is Bloomberg His forecast now is for GDP to be lowered to 0.5 for next year. Anything, 0.5% um, uh, is probably overly optimistic. It is quite a hawkish tone from the Fed, um, more hawkish than the markets had been expecting. What that tells you is he's not forecasting recession, but that's as close to a recession as they ever get. They have to have slowed the economy down sufficiently to generate enough slack in the labor market so wage trends come down to be consistent with 2% inflation. We've had a kind of a back and forth and a little bit of debate of, you know, whether we've seen the bottom in, in, in equity markets. I, I think the jury is still out and I think a more cautious stance is, is still warranted. The key components are still quite sticky and that would suggest more tightening is needed. That was some of our guests here on Bloomberg Television reacting to the Fed's decision to hike 50 basis points and Chairman Powell's remarks. Joining us now for her reaction is Danielle DiMartino Booth, Quill Intelligence CEO and Chief Strategist. Danielle, great to see you again. You were also here after the last Fed meeting yep. and press conference, and you told us that Fed that Fed Chairman Powell was like a one-man dot plot oh, yeah. at the podium that day. We now have a dot plot, and it reflects maybe a bit more consensus on the FOMC. They all seem to be sending the same message. Is the market receiving? it properly? I think so. And I think that what really uh, spooked the markets yesterday was the consistency. In fact, Chair Powell was asked specifically, were those dot plots turned in on Friday at close of business? Because Friday close of business is typically when they have to be submitted. However, they can be altered up to the, the night of the first day of the meeting, as in Tuesday night after the CPI print came out and they still held. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was really what got the markets, as well as the fact that as far out as the dot plot went, you saw a terminal rate of two and a half percent. In other words, we're, we're not going to maybe ever visit the zero bound again. And you talk about the questions that P Chairman Powell received at the press conference. The very first one was about financial conditions that have gotten easier. Mm -hmm. He didn't push back as aggressively as some thought he might have been able to. Was that a mistake? No, I really don't think so. I, it, I, I kind of felt watching those first few questions that the reporters were trying to bait him and see if they couldn't get the angry Jay Powell to come out. Um, and, and I think that in the end, what, what was even a little bit more disturbing was how calm and cool and collected he was in maintaining his narrative. And it's, he's like, you know, we don't need to concentrate as much on the size of the rate hikes going forward as much as the fact that we're going to keep them there for a long time. The implicit message there is that we're going to keep shrinking that balance sheet month after mm. month after month. That is a form of tightening. Right. Danielle, that's really interesting, isn't it? The role that QT could play, uh, you know, as we as we get towards the end of the hiking cycle, but then also during a pause and then what happens to it as we cut. You said something interesting, though. You talked about how we are not going back to the zero bound ever again, uh, or at least maybe it's starting to look that way. And we've had quite a few conversations this week with investors and analysts and economists really rethinking their medium term inflation expectations for a host of reasons to do with sustainability, uh, to do with um, and what that does to commodities prices of course to do with geopolitics and, and other things aging for example so where do you fall into in on that where is the medium term outlook for inflation so I think um, I, I think that there is going to be a higher sustained level um, the one aspect you didn't mention and you mentioned a lot of great ones uh, is reshoring 
And you know, there, if, if you look at company conference calls, there has been quite a bit of, of blanket discussion of uh, bringing manufacturing back on shore. I don't think that this is a phenomenon that's unique to the United States, but there's something implicit in not looking for the, 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 the least expensive labor around the world uh, to make things. And that implies that you're going to have a higher level of inflation than you would otherwise. And so what does that do to rates then, Danielle? What kind of level of rates do we settle at, if that's even possible, as we go through 2023 and into 24? Well, what was fascinating was that they actually had their core PCE forecast coming in um, below where they saw the Fed funds rate at the end of 2023. That's not really how the world works. Uh, you're not supposed to have short-term borrowing costs above where you perceive uh, inflation as, as falling to. I'm actually not of the opinion, though, that, that there's as much slack in the labor market as what is being advertised. Uh, Kayla and I were talking just before we came on the air about this, about a website that tracks all the closures of companies uh, in the United States. For the month of December, we've already surpassed that of the month of November and the month of October. So there is indeed uh, damage being uh, wreaked with this lag effect that I think is coming in more quickly than the, the long and variable 18 to 24 months that we've grown accustomed to. I think that the magnitude of these rate hikes, 425 basis points since, um, since March, I think that, that that tells us that the lags are going to be shorter. That context is so important considering where we were just nine months ago right, and how far course. we have come. This is the fastest since 1981. So if we're moving that fast, Technically, when you move faster, in theory, you can break things easier. I mean, of where course. is the soft landing argument now? I don't, you know, um, so another one of your guests was saying this is about as close as we possibly get to the Fed acknowledging recession. I mean, 0.5% is a rounding error. The National Bureau of Economic Research that scores recessions, in fact, you know, we're about $40 billion away, give or take, from the NBER saying that recession started in January of 2022 in a $23 trillion economy. So we could actually already be there. And you know what? The Fed's full of economists, and they know this. <laughs> so they're aware of the policy that's being undertaken, despite what's happening. Jay Powell stood at the podium yesterday, and he said, we know that housing prices are going to come down next year. Yeah. We're going to keep going anyways. They're going to tolerate that pain, or at least so they right. say. We'll see exactly. if they can follow exactly. through on that. Danielle DiMartino Booth of Quill Intelligence, great to see you as always. Likewise. Happy Thank holidays. You Thank so you so much, and same to you. All right, now let's keep you up to date with other news from around the world to watch with the first word. Executives at failed crypto exchange FTX used a mysterious account to help hide ballooning debts of its sister trading firm, Alameda Research. That's according to internal documents reviewed by Bloomberg News. The account bore the name of FTX's engineering director. In China, economic activity weakened last month before the government abruptly dropped its COVID-0 policy. Retail sales and home sales declined, while industrial output and investment slowed sharply. Meanwhile, unemployment rose, notably for the country's most valuable workers. Disruptions are likely to grow as COVID infections surge. In Peru, violent protests have led the government to declare a state of emergency as, and suspend basic rights for 30 days. New President Dina Boluarte is trying to establish her authority and restore order. At least seven people have died in clashes involving demonstrators demanding the release of former President Pedro Castillo. He was arrested after trying to dissolve Congress. And BlackRock is one of the targets as Florida escalates its war against asset managers that offer environmental, social, and government investments. The state's chief financial officer says more state money will be pulled from BlackRock, saying that CEO Larry Fink, quote, really did it to himself. And Anna, this has been so interesting to watch evolve as there was such a push toward ESG investments, and now you're seeing some real political pushback against that. Mm. Yeah, and I thought really interesting to see that Goldman Sachs research today talking about the uh, the way that they think that commodities are going to be uh, higher in price next year by more than 40%, partly because of a lack of investment. And it's some of that ESG mm. impulse that's led to a lack of investment in the sector, in the views of some. HSBC just announcing this morning that they are no longer going to fund any new oil and gas exploration sites, which is an interesting one from such a large bank globally. Coming up on this program, we'll continue the theme of energy, in fact. We'll be live from the Forum, Forum of the Americas in Paris. Angie's chairman will join us. That conversation about the European energy space. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Fed Chair Jerome Powell sees interest rates being higher for longer, but investors see the outlook for next year a little differently. The Bank of England and the European Central Bank are out with their own rate decisions today. Both are likely to slow the pace of rate hikes. And Elon Musk unloads Tesla stock for the fourth time this year. He sells another $3.6 billion worth of shares. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kayleigh Lines in New York. Matt Miller is off today. And it seems maybe the market, uh, the way the markets are performing, Kayleigh, suggesting that maybe some people had slightly more dovish expectations of mm. the Fed uh, than, than actually materialized yesterday. Yeah, I think that's right, Anna. Overall, we'd heard people saying that the, the statement and the press conference were screaming hawkishness, yet the market yesterday at least seemed to cling to any individual perhaps perceived dovish thing that they could with stocks closing off of session lows uh, yesterday after hearing from Chairman Powell. What's interesting, though, is that losses are accelerating as the future in session grows older, uh, grows older this morning after. Right now, S&P 500 futures down about 1.1%, so maybe that hawkishness really is sinking in. And after yield moved slightly lower yesterday. They now are heading back up. The two-year yield up about three and a half basis points at the moment. 424.46 is where we trade. While the dollar is gaining strength against all G10 currencies, the Bloomberg dollar index stronger by about six tenths of one percent and crude essentially flat on the day. $77 a barrel where we trade at the moment. As for some individual stocks to watch, Anna, you mentioned this another Tesla share sale from Elon Musk. This one worth about $3.6 billion. His total share sales over the last 12 months now approach approaching $40 billion. So that is dragging on the stock this morning. It's down about 2.8%. And remember, already it is down 55% on the year. Is that mostly concerned about Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter and distractions uh, from that? Is that actually having to do with fundamentals of the company and weakness in demand in China? Maybe both at the same time. You're seeing other weakness in tech stocks as well. Apple, down about 1.3%, and NVIDIA is down 2.5%. In addition to the broader drag on large cap technology we're seeing today, it also uh, was initiated with coverage at HSBC with a reduced rating. The analysts there citing weak demand in the chip space, and then it's also analyst action weighing on Western Digital today. It was downgraded at Goldman Sachs, so that stock down 4.5% before the bell, Anna. OK, a lot to focus on in the pre-market movers. This is the European story right now. It looks weaker, down by 1.2% on the stocks Europe 600. You mentioned weakness in tech stocks, weakness almost across the board, it seems, for European equity markets. We have a lot of central banks in focus today. Let's start with the uh, one we've heard from already, the Swiss National Bank coming through with a 50 basis point hike, as expected, up to 1.1% 1 .1, uh, on their rates. Uh, we see weakness in the currency, but is that more to do with dollar strength? Because dollar strength seems to be a theme across the board. We have the dollar stronger against the pound, the pound down 7 tenths of a percent. On the day we hear from the Bank of England, will we get a four-way split there in terms of that decision? And we'll also hear from the ECB with the euro down six-tenths of one percent against the US dollar. A focus there, Kayleigh, very much on quantitative tightening and whether we get any further details around that story. But broadly expecting a follow-on from the Fed, 50 basis points uh, from both of these central banks. OK, Anna, well, clearly central banks are a big focus today, but there also is another event, event ongoing in Paris where m major international shareholders are gathering at the Forum of the Americas. So let's get over to there now. Bloomberg's Danny Berger is there and she is joined with the chairman of NG. Danny. Kaylee, thank you so much. That's right. Chairman of NG with me now is Jean-Pierre Clamadieu. Uh, thank you so much for joining. It's great to see you in a very cold Paris. I know I've been complaining about it all morning to you. Um, but this is part of the conversation, right? It is finally cold here in Europe. It's been mild. We avoided perhaps the worst of an energy crisis. The IEA fatty B-roll says the worst is yet to come. Europe risks being complacent. Is he right? Does Europe risk being complacent? I think we always risk to be complacent, and I think it's very good to hear a voice like Fatih Birol saying, yes, be careful, guys, the challenge is, uh, challenges are yet to come. I think what, is, what happened this week is very good news, because we had a pretty severe cold spell in the northern part of France and part of Europe, and we've been able to go through without any issue. Mm. Gas infrastructure is working very well. We have gas flowing in a very optimal way to make sure that the end consumers will receive what they expect. And on the electricity side, where we have a bit of a challenge in France, you know, 
due to the, uh, the situation with our nuclear power plants, we've been able also uh, to feed customers and uh, there was no, no disruption at all. So, so we've news, survived the stress We've survived test. this week yes. and I think it's a good sign for the rest of the winter. What needs to happen to make sure the rest of the winter and winter 23 can continue in that path? Well, it's a bit di different on electricity and gas. On electricity, what we need is to make sure that EDF, French, uh, uh, French uh, utility, will be able to bring the majority of its nuclear plants online. Uh, they have a plan to, uh, to, go back to, the, uh, to go back to a normal level of operation. Their uh, CEO has confirmed yesterday that he was optimistic that they will be able to achieve that. On gas side, we are seeing a significant reduction in consumption, 10% more or less, a bit more in some countries. That's good news. It shows that people are listening to the messages regarding the need for energy conservation. We need to see LNG continuing to flow, uh, and that's, we've been able to, uh, to reorganize our access to gas in the last six months. I want months. to ask that in NG specifically, in terms of being able to reorganize that. Have you been able, I know you've had some contracts with U.S. suppliers, for example, have you been able to completely replace the Russian supply? Yes, we have completely, at NG, if you take the NG uh, situation, we have completely replaced uh, Russian gas, uh, thanks to more gas coming from Norway, more gas coming from the US, and a few other countries helping us uh, rebalance our contract portfolio. But is that sustainable, especially as China starts to come back on the map? I mean, this is a competitive market. For NG, I think we are pretty confident. When I look at uh, the commitment we have with our customers and uh, the way we are able to manage our contract, I think we'll be able to go through next winter. But the challenge is for Europe as a whole. Once again, we have a situation which gives us today uh, the view that we will be able to go through next winter, despite the fact that there won't be any more Russian gas or a very limited flow of Russian gas. Now, uh, we need to make sure we continue to save energy, one, and we need to make sure we continue to access LNG. If China was to pick, if China's economic activity was to pick up, it would be a point of attention. But even in the past few days after the announcement that the COVID restriction would be lifted, we have not seen any tension on the LNG market. Mm. So, so far, so good in terms of access to energy. The big challenge for Europe, as you know, are the prices. Yes, that's the other piece of the puzzle, the price cap debate, which 300 kilometers from us, Brussels unable to solve that, still can't reach an agreement. The initial drafts, of course, have the price cap so high that it likely won't be triggered, triggered, which Germany, of course, likes. Other countries disagree. What do you think the solution should be? We've been advocating for a gas cap at Engie, and we've been advocating because we've seen extreme prices. I mean, uh, gas prices in Europe have been between 10 and 20 euro per megawatt hour for decades. Uh, we've seen prices as high as 300 euro per megawatt hour at the end of August. This was not the fact that there was a competition between Asia or Europe to access to gas. It was a huge risk premium, mm. which has no reason to be fair. So our view is that a price cap would help avoid these types of situations. Obviously, there need to be another mechanism to ensure that we would be able to import the LNG that we need. Am I optimistic that a solution will uh, appear today? I used to be an optimistic person. In this case, I think the debate will be very complex. Are and you? I'm not sure that we will end up with something which, at the end of the day, will have an impact. Are, are you worried about European unity in general as these debates go on? I think on the, what we've seen on the energy field is not reassuring. We've seen uh, the beginning of a fragmentation of the uh, European landscape, uh, the decision which was taken about the way electricity producers should be taxed, which was a very weak position from Brussels, saying this is the system I suggest, but each country can adjust it. So we have very different situation in countries where NG operates, France, Belgium, Italy, each country seems to try to design its own scheme. It's not good. Uh, and uh, I hope that the next discussion on the electricity market design will continue to help make sure that we have a European system. But what, European what system, happens if we don't, though? What happens if European system on? is very powerful. If we are able to go through this week without major issues in France, it's because we are able to import electricity. At the same time, we are exporting gas to Germany. So the European unity is a very key element to make sure that we can all together go through this energy crisis. And if if we are not able to continue this way, there will be sub There will, will be in a suboptimal system. And uh, this would create issues regarding uh, security of supply and probably will lead to higher prices. Mm. Well, part of the issue for Europe is that just the economy is built off of cheap energy sources, which is Russia. I mean, can industry, can it stay competitive? 
without Russian energy, without that cheap source? It's very uh, challenging. Midterm, the solution is uh, very simple. Let's move massively towards renewable energy. That's really the direction of travel for Europe with nuclear in countries like France where nuclear enjoy political support. Short term, there's a need for a number of adjustments and it's where we to make sure that prices stay reasonable. They will always be much higher than in the US and it's where we would need the EU to react and act mm. as, a, as a European, uh, as Euro, uh, showing European leadership. And it's an area where we are probably lacking a bit of this leadership. Well, well speaking of, of the U.S., of course, the U.S. enacted the Inflation Reduction Act. Part of this drew the ire of Europe because it does give subsidies to green manufacturers in Europe, perhaps preferring those over Europe. What should Europe's answer be to that? First, it would be a united European answer. It can be country by country. Uh, second, we have to realize what's happening in the U.S. U.S. is creating in a number of areas great opportunities for people to invest. Europe is still very much in a regulation. Let's develop the regulation mode. We need to incentivize industries to continue to produce and develop innovation in Europe. And that's a big challenge that we need to face again all together. All right, Jean-Pierre, thank you so much for joining. Really you. appreciate your time. And Anna, with that, I'll throw it back to you. Jean-Pierre Klamaju there, the chair of Energy. NG, it might be ECB day, but it is below freezing in Paris. Energy is certainly <laughs> top of mind. Danny, thank you very much for braving the cold for us in Paris. Well, if it's any consolation, it's pretty cold here in London, uh, where you where you normally reside, Danny. So thank you, Danny Berger there on the road in Paris. Danny will have more interviews from the Forum of the Americas, including the CEOs of Societe Generale and Man Group. So look out for those over coming days. Coming up on this programme, we will get back to the central bank narratives that uh, Danny was just referencing. Josie Dent joins us, managing economist at the Centre for Economics and Business Research, the CEBR here in the UK, but talking about the Bank of England and the ECB, what to expect from those hikes. This is Blinkbeck. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, an interview with Bridgewater co-CIO Greg Jensen. That's at 10 a.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Kaylee Lines in New York. Let's move on to the central bank, uh, central banks that are in focus today, pushing ahead to the Bank of England and the ECB with their rate decisions due. Both are poised to slow the recent pace of hikes, both to step down from 75 to 50. That's the market's expectation, at least. Joining us now is Josie Dent, Managing Economist at the Centre for Economics and Business Research. Let's start with the Bank of England then, Josie. Very nice to have you with us. Uh, there is the possibility we get a four-way split in the voting, such as the uncertainty around the UK economic outlook right now, the cost of living crisis, the inflation pressures, all of that coming together to mean that we could see policymakers voting for very different things. What's your expectation? So we are in line with consensus expectations that overall there will be a 50 basis point rise um, from the Bank of England today. But it's a really tricky path, uh, a narrow path that policymakers have to follow between trying to control this very high inflation we have at 10.7% in November in the UK, but then also the fact that we're probably in a recession right now after a 0.2% contraction in Q3, and we're forecasting three more quarters of contraction um, over the coming quarters into the first half of next year. Um, and so while, you know, raising interest rates um, will help control that inflation, hopefully bring down some spending, reduce demand, and therefore bring down the, the rate of inflation, um, policymakers do fear the recessionary impacts of that. While there is already expected to be a recession, they could deepen it with too mm. harsh a policy. You know, some might vote today for a 75 basis point rise, um, some might vote for a smaller rise, and it's really to do with those, those preferences in terms of should we try and reduce inflation or should we try and limit the size of the recession? Yeah. So those are the key How questions that they're thinking about. 
Yes, and how concerned are you about the exposure of UK households to higher interest rates and mortgage costs? Because uh, the uh, stability review that we got from the Bank of England earlier on this week referenced this, gave us some size and scope around the number of households, the percentage of the population even, that will be uh, exposed to these higher rates in their mortgage costs in the, in the few years ahead. Exactly. So in the UK, it's pretty standard to have around a two-year fix on your mortgage. Um, but then with interest rates expected to remain high for, for a considerable period over the coming year or two, um, the majority of households who are currently on a fixed rate mortgage will come off that um, in, in the coming years. Um, and then we'll have to remortgage or, or will face a higher variable rate um, on their interest rate on their mortgage. And of course, housing costs are one of the biggest costs that anyone pays for um, in their lifetime, be it rent or your mortgage. And with those going up, then this is one of the biggest factors that's going to drive the cost of living crisis um, over the next year. Of course, we're seeing food prices rise, energy prices rise, and those have been placing considerable impacts on households. But as more and more households come off their fixed rate mortgage and are facing higher mortgage costs, this will have impacts on the housing market and massive impacts on the amount people can afford. Mm. Um, they might have to cut back in other areas in order to afford their mortgage. And so this is a significant impact that's driving this recession. The fact that if people have to spend all their money on their higher mortgage, then they won't be able to spend in other areas. Um, so it's a big cause of concern and, and a big factor that's, that's probably going to be driving this recession. Well, Josie, you mentioned so many factors that are putting pressure on households in the UK, including energy. And I'm wondering, as Danny Berger was just talking about this with the chairman of Angie, the reopening of China, which in theory is going to drive more demand for energy and make that even more competitive. How much upside risk to inflation does that pose, not just in the UK, but in Europe as well? Yeah, I mean, so, so in the UK, households, in terms of their energy bills that they pay for, for electricity and gas, are somewhat now protected by the Energy Price Guarantee Scheme. Um, but of course, you know, there are still so many pressures you face in terms of um, prices at the pump, which have been falling recently and, and have caused this slightly lower inflation that we saw in November. Um, but at some point, you know, the Energy Price Guarantee Scheme is going to end and people will face higher pressures at the pump. Um, and so with more demand from China, that higher demand equals higher prices on the open market, that could increase um, mm. increase the price of, of energy and have big impacts, um, both in terms of consumers who are, uh, who are facing across Europe, the, the impact of higher energy prices on their household bills, big costs for the UK government in terms of guaranteeing prices when, when they're rising. Um, and so knock on impacts on, on UK debt. Yeah. Um, and of course, industry it has a big impact on um, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, they, they are incredibly energy intensive businesses when you look at construction and manufacturing businesses. Right. Um, and so then that might drive more inflation because businesses will have to pass on those higher costs to consumers. So there is a considerable upside risk. Um, we are actually, we are forecasting inflation to slow both across the Eurozone and, and the UK um, next year, but it could slow at a, a weaker rate um, if energy prices remain high because they are one of the biggest forces that drive inflation. Okay, so Josie, let's zero in on Europe and more specifically the ECB, the other central bank that has to make a decision today. If 50 basis points is baked in, maybe more of the question surrounds QT. What is your expectation there? So, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, that. Um, that we are expecting a 50 basis point rise. And, and, and the ECB has similar problems um, to, to the Bank of England in terms of the worry about a recession. We're forecasting just 0.1% GDP growth for the, for the Eurozone as a whole next year. Um, and, you know, whether or not they have to tighten in terms of QT as, a, alongside this, um, this basis point hike of around probably 50 basis points um, to, the, to the main interest rates, um, you know, as they try and get a hold on inflation, um, it is a big question because um, inflation in the Eurozone is slow in November, um, but it's still at 10%, which is five times, um, you know, their target rate of roughly 2%. Mm. Um, and so, you know, the, the methods that they use to get a control over on inflation include, of course, not just uh, raising interest rates, um, but also, you know, considering should they start selling the vast quantity of bonds that they built up um, over the course of the pandemic to support um, the yes. economy, to support businesses. Um, and, and so we may well start to see more of tightening there. 
Josie, thank you. Yes, inflation really varied across the Eurozone as well. Some areas uh, in single digits and some up as high as the low 20% level. Uh, Josie Dent, thank you very much for joining us from the Centre for Economics and Business Research, talking there about the Bank of England and the ECB. And stay with Bloomberg for full coverage of both of those central bank decisions. We will bring you uh, all that you need to know when uh, following the central bank decisions. There is Christine Lagarde and the details of the ECB decision. We'll also, of course, bring you what is the latest from the Bank of England. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Matt Miller is off today. So let's take a look at what he is missing, what's coming up in the day ahead. We will continue our focus on this massive week for central banks. We're going to get the BOE rate decision at 7 a.m. Eastern time. 50 basis points is what is expected. The question is, how much disagreement is there uh, among the members of the BOE? Then that's followed up by the ECB decision at 8 a.m. Eastern time. Again, 50 basis points is what is expected. The question is surrounding quantitative tightening. Then we'll get some economic data here in the U.S. as well, including initial jobless claims, retail sales, and industrial production data. So as much as we all might want it to be, Anna, the year definitely is not over. We have, at the very least, one more big day to get through. Yeah, one more big day to get through in terms of those central bank decisions. Interesting on that U.S. industrial production data, though. I think there's an expectation that manufacturing output slows a little bit, but there's strength in vehicles and parts. And it takes me back to the start of the program where we're talking about strength in the auto sector. Mm. Order books still looking full, but concern about demand. And, and it's an interesting one, isn't it? What kind of macro signals we're getting from that sector? Are they accurate macro signals? I suppose if we're looking for broader macro signals, I do wonder whether we're done after this week, Kaylee, or whether <laughs> we still have to pay attention next week. I mean, are we done until, what is it, the jobs report on January the 6th? Can we, uh, can we, can we kind of come back then? Yeah, maybe. Although I will say, Anna's going to be here in New York next week. So I do hope we have some stuff to talk about for your visit <laughs> to the U.S. At the very, very least, that alone uh, will be newsworthy. We're all looking forward to that very much. So, Anna, definitely an interesting day in terms of uh, the macro signals. We're going to get more in the next few hours. And, of course, they're going to be taking us through all of that on surveillance. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And really interesting to see if we get that four-way split at the Bank of England. I mean, that's not the base expectation. I spoke to analysts earlier who were saying, no, it could still be 7-2. That's the division between those voting for that hike and those voting for something different. But we will watch and see how the nine members of the MPC uh, fall into line or don't when it comes to this rate hike that is expected today. More surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg.